I'm out here at the main six acre original edible acres site today working on some projects finalizing some local plant sales with folks and I thought at the end of a nice long day it would be fun to wander through the property and look at a 12 year old food forest starting to wake up so stick around let's look at these apricots these are seedling apricots Siberian apricots we originally got from Oikos tree crops way back in 2009 and they're in their peak flower and if I'm quiet enough maybe you can still hear all the bees it's incredible early spring browse there are many years where we get a frost while they're in bloom or directly after and we lose the whole crop but so far things seem to be coming together that it's warm enough, dry enough, the pollination is really strong and we don't have any frost uh, for the next little while. So this apricot, every flower may turn into a fruit and it's being pollinated by this even much larger one to the north. Brianna apricot, we are trying, hopefully we get enough uh, fruit this summer that Sasha can make some videos about how she preserves this incredible apricot jam and we'll have enough seed that we can actually offer it in earnest next year. It's a beautiful plant though. Not to get too stuck on the apricots, but an interesting pattern that we're exploring. These are, we're looking to the south, so that's the southernmost apricot, that's a northern one. And then as we, what we notice is that they get woken up very early, they flower very early, and one in, or two out of every three years, they get frosted. And so the thought was, well, since we're getting enough seedlings, what does it look like to keep moving them further and further north? And so we put, a, put some apricots back in here, and you can see they're just coming into their age to begin bearing but by being a little bit uh, more in the shade their flowers are here but they haven't swollen yet so let's say we were to get a frost tonight this apricot may be able to make some fruit wherever, whereas the ones that were triggered to flower early would have lost them so really interesting opportunity to play into different microclimates that i think over time has a huge amount of value it's a pretty fun moment on the ground here where fuki is at a sweet spot you can see these are the flowering tops of the Fuki. This is a Japanese cult's foot. And these little flowers are very early in the season. We're really at the beginning of all this. The pears, the apples, most of those trees haven't really started swelling flower buds. So this is some early browse. You can see this year's leaves starting to come up. But these flowers, they smell a little like wintergreen and they're a great browse for flies for some reason, but honeybees like them too. So. On a warm day like this, a honeybee can come, land on an apricot blossom, and then take a sip off of a fuki and head on their merry way. And probably wonder, how the heck did that come to pass? <laughs> We're working as fast as we can to get our air prune boxes up and running again this year. So all of the boxes in front of us here have uh, hazelnuts and peaches. We're going to aim to have a whole bunch of nice seedling peaches for some really diverse organic orchard stock uh, for the fall. So they're just getting up to speed. And in front of us, you can see, this is a mother bed of Turkish rocket and rhubarb and sea kale all through here. Look at that sea kale, really early to emerge. This is the one, most of the ones that we send out to folks come from this line. And it's a really interesting one that comes up very, very purple. It eventually turns green. You can see the greenness here, but the early flower, the early leaves are very, very purple, almost like deep purple. And you can see this one has its stalk about ready to shoot up. So we might harvest that this year as an early broccoli. You can see Turkish rocket, a nice carpet of last year's seedlings. A lot of what we dug up for the nursery came from right in there. And so these will have a chance to become much larger this year. It's kind of fun that a productive nursery bed can be diverse and have interrelationship happening. We can be nibbling on it while it's developing the plants. It's a wild scene in here, a little air prune two foot by four foot box of peaches in air prune so there's about 150 seeds planted in there a whole sea of fuki they're even happier back in here because it's under the shade of some of these spruce so this will be a lot cooler and more moist for them in the summer months and they'll make a nice mulch that we can cut and bring up forward as needed and then another bed that's got some sea kale these are potato onions which we're trying to ramp up the numbers of it's a perennial multiplying onion for storage these are a good King Henry 
really coming into their own. These are probably third year plants, so very well established. And we hope to save seed and spread it all through this area. It can be eaten as a raw green early in the spring, but it's much better cooked. Uh, it's really nice we're coming into that early spring moment. There's tons of stinging nettles to harvest. There are dandelion greens that we can be harvesting. Lots of garlic mustard, and then Good King Henry is just a beautiful perennial spinach analog that is nearly indestructible. We're so psyched that we get to offer that through the website now. Oh, and another character that shows up a lot on the website is the Sweet Sicily. Very early, very fast to emerge. These leaves taste like a very mild licorice, like a lettucey licorice. They're beautiful early in the spring. You can see how big their stalks are. These will get about three to four feet before they start to really flower. A little tarragon in there just for even more diversity. Why not? We've been going through some of our nursery beds and trying to dig up plants for spring shipping and to get plants in folks' hands. But we didn't, for example, get into these apples. But just as a side note, we'll make another video about this, but I'm pretty sure we're going to make the time that right in front of me, that's about 250 chestnuts that are still asleep enough that they need to find homes. And we might do a flash sale this week coming up for all the remaining chestnuts, uh, hazelnuts, pawpaws, persimmons, maybe even some of the apricots that we've grown. But we'll give you a heads up on that. We just, we can't possibly plant that many more and we've saturated our local sales. So hopefully we'll do a last hurrah round in the next few days on some of these plants. Stay tuned on that one. Some of the very diverse beds in here are filling out nicely. There's definitely gaps in the mulch. I can see some bare soil here or there, but the plants grow so quickly and they fill in so quickly that it works out in the end. In front of us, it's so crazy complex. I'll just rattle off a couple. There's Tayberry in the front. There is Illinois Everbearing Mulberry right about there. There's a White Currant. There's a Yasta Berry. There's a Pawpaw with a Hellebore as an understory. There's a whole line of Yasta Berry cuttings in the front, which we will stool layer this year all sorts of herbaceous ground covering plants. The garlic mustard more than welcome until we need the space for somebody else, but there's tarragon and sweet Sicily and good King Henry all through here. Whole bunch of sprawling, thorny, wild blackberry types, some rhubarb, this whole patch of mugwort, miscanthus grass, chayfruit, American persimmons. Then it gets into all sorts of sunchokes, a couple of varieties, some gummies, and then a bunch of nut trees at the end. There's probably uh, at least uh, at least 40 or 50 different types of plants, at least 100 different plantings in this one little teardrop island in the lawn. I love this crazy, crazy complexity. That big friend is our Hall's Hardy Almond. Big potential fruit load. They haven't started to swell their uh, flowers just yet, but self-fertile, I believe, and should rain down a whole bunch of small peaches, not very delicious peaches, with a really nice quality almond on the inside. So. Fingers crossed we get to eat almonds and pecans this year. Boy, oh boy, would that be nice. It feels like we're coming into, at least in this region, a really promisingly productive year. A lot of the fruit trees and nut trees seem poised to just do incredible work. We'll just have to see, pardon my hand, I look like I was in a bar fight. Just imagine I was, well, it was in the earth for the last many days, but Anyway, yeah, these trees really loaded with lots of beautiful flowers. Even if we don't get fruit, just to have that, that flush of nectar flow for the bees and the beauty is worth its weight in gold. But my God, if we could eat all the fruit from these things this year, these wonderful plant beings, I would be thrilled. It's a really simple guild in front of me that happens twice here where we've got a shrub layer in the front. This is a cultivar gumi that we're also stool layering at the bottom and then a foot or two to the north of the gumi, the nitrogen fixing shrub, is a keystone overstory tree. So in this case, it is a grafted plum. And then I move over a few feet to the east and a different named variety gumi. So the two can talk to each other and pollinate and a foot or two to the north, a grafted, is this another plum? I'd have to look at the tag, but they should be ready to start making fruit this year. So we get an understory of delicious fruit that we can save seed to propagate from that can be pruned and managed to make sure that the overstory gets uh, their needs met. And that'll provide nitrogen and fuel to fuel the overstory to produce. And since the nitrogen fixer is to the south, they get a lot of the light they need. 
and this tree will get taller and taller, casting shade to the north, so they'll partition the light available in a functional way. And of course, you gotta got some daffodils on the side. Nice to have the long view here of all these tufts of white flowers in front of us. That one's another apricot, a seedling from those first Brianna's. But the rest of the white flowers you see, which are very similar in size uh, and look, these are all Nanking cherries. In fact, this landscape has huge numbers of them, especially as we go underneath those pines. Really lovely surprise that the white pines are still compatible with the needs of the Nanking cherry. They've been able to produce reliably in the shade of the pines. So in fact, as I walk here, I'm aiming southward and just south of these really large pines, old, old pines, uh, is a row of Nanking cherry that are just stacked top to bottom with flowers. You can see one there, one here. This one is our most productive. And fingers crossed, again, this will be a good year. I think the pine helps keep them from waking up super, super early. There's lots of flowers that are still closed. This provides a beautiful browse for the wild bees. And if all works out, every flower on this that you are looking at would translate into a fruit and therefore would translate into a potential future Nanking cherry seedling. So 2022, if things work out, we should be able to say yes to everyone who wants a Nanking cherry. We just have to do our part. That Nanking is just such a beautiful filler plant. Like right in here, this glossy, exquisite overstory tree is a Carpathian walnut, which eventually be way, way, way up in the canopy, probably casting enough shade that everybody else will disappear. There's a red bud woven through the Carpathian as a nitrogen fixer and as a beautiful early spring browse for bees. And then the Nanking cherry just tucks right in underneath and will get fruit for a bunch of years, probably another five, 10 years, the rest of the red bud and Carpathian will be big enough that the Nanking will start to fade out and that's fine. Their roots will be absorbed by the keystone tree. And maybe we'll think about a shade tolerant vine to run up that Carpathian. But that level of um, complexity and diversity and density also translates into resilience and compatibility. We do not water these gardens. Pretty much any that you see here go through droughts with no problems. And if a few were to fail from some catastrophic weather event or disease or herbivory or pressure, it would just be a relief to the system for room for other things to happen. So in fact, this Night King cherry directly to its south has a understory of black currants all throughout and under the black currants are sorrel and around the sorrel are solomon seal throughout that are really shade tolerant so top to bottom there's layers upon layers of plants that can be having interrelationship with each other and they it really does work this is 12 years in and very little management as far as basic needs of these plants they they just keep growing this main garden's kind of a mess. We'll do another video about this once we're caught up, but this is where we've got our honeyberry stool beds, a couple different varieties in here. We've got some uh, sour cherries, Carmine Jewel and Latoka Rose and Evans Bali all throughout. So lots of different diverse uh, nutrient dense fruits. Whole sea berry orchard off to the south with more hascaps next to a pond. Blah, blah, blah. But it's popping. There are lots of flowers. It feels so good to see the bees back and active. I could use some rain already. The ponds are holding water well. We'll do another tour of those in more detail later, uh, but it would be nice to have some more rain for all the transplanting we're doing. But beautiful to see the promise in all of these plants set in motion, some of them 12 years ago. They're my, they're my kids. It's so crazy. This was the one, there were a few we planted. This one was one of the first Nanking cherries. These would be children of these Nanking cherries, and these are their grandchildren. And there are even great grandchildren in here planted by the mice. For example, this cluster of Nanking cherries were planted last year by mice. We'll dig them up and pot them up. This happens every year. The wildlife will harvest the fruit and put them in caches in the garden with full anticipation of eating them and they miss some and we get a whole bunch of seedling stock right there. So four generations of Nanking cherry and counting. I'm looking forward to a fifth generation after the next year or two. 
there you go that's about all i got i gotta get back to work keep transplanting because it might rain tomorrow hope you are well where you are let me know if you have questions about these wacky interrelationship pattern sort of things once plants leaf out a little bit more i'm gonna do some deep dive uh, guild breakdowns in videos there have been some requests on that um, a little bit about design consideration but more than anything helping folks feel a little less pressure about having to get it perfect before you do it just showing over and over again that these plants get along thanks so much for watching this long video happy spring to you